If you enjoy the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentreview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. It was from there and so once we got there I went through the usual, you know, making models and all that good stuff. As we all did. As we all did, <laughs> yes. Um, and um, yeah, I, that's what I wanted to do. Um, one of the things that did happen uh, was that I didn't know about this but my father found out that you could have a pre-assessment uh, to join the RAF and the, the whole idea was, and I thought it was pretty enlightened at the time, was that you go at about 15 and go through all the checks and then if you're blind, deaf, whatever, <laughs> something that's going to stop you dead from doing it, then they tell you there and then and that's the end of it. And I thought I was pretty enlightened at the time. <laughs> and so I did, I did do that um, and failed it. <laughs> <laughs> but having said that, it wasn't, it wasn't quite as bad as that because I was in amongst, I was 15, and I was in amongst guys of 20 something. You know, it's a big gap there, so Absolutely. you're slightly intimidated. Um, but anyway, the upshot of it all was, they sat you in a room uh, and they called you forward and they told you what the story was. And the guy said to me, look mate, um, you need to brush up on your maths and physics and you, you walk it, don't worry about it. So just brush up on that and then come back. But technically, you failed it because you failed the maths. No surprise, frankly, the maths, <laughs> but there we are. So that's, that's how it came. And um, I then went a year or so later and did the proper thing um, down in, was it in Cranmore? I can't remember now. Anyway, I, I did that and got an, an 18 year commission and I was over the moon. <laughs> I can imagine. So can you tell us some of the aircraft you started training on? Yes, well, uh, in those days you went straight on to jets and so it was the Jet Provost 3 or the Jet Provost 4 uh, later on and, um, and and really that was about it. And I mean if you think back that's probably what the performance of a Spitfire or something like that. So yeah. plenty enough for a young <laughs> lad. <laughs> um, I, apart from once, I'd never flown before and because I'd been in the Cadet Corps at, um, at school, um, that allowed me, it gave me license to go and have a trip in a in a vampire oh nice yes so off i went at, again about 15 or something and when it was around in this vampire for 40 minutes it was absolutely wonderful until i started feeling sick <laughs> <laughs> um but something i he showed me some aerobatics which almost caused my demise some two or three years later but we'll come around to that <laughs> yeah maybe did you have any incidents going through training um yes i did um there were there were there were two really. Um, one of them was uh, I did my solo and I've forgotten you. You have probably one or two trips after that, um, and then and then you're off again. But you're solo proper. But you, it's that sort of solo that you just fly around the airfield. Don't don't lose sight of the airfield. That, right. Right. So I was flying. It was a lovely day. I was flying around the clouds and I got bored. <laughs> And, and I thought, oh, no, what shall I do? I, I know, I'll do some aerobatics, which was not wise because I'd not been shown any and um, I'd seen some and that was about it. So I thought, I'll try a loop. So I pulled about this loop and as I was going up, I watched all the speed rushing off and thought, oh, God, that doesn't look right. Oh, no. Um, so I came out of that. Anyway, I did two or three of those and none of, none of them worked. In retrospect, I wasn't pulling anywhere near hard enough, but there we are. Um, so uh, then I thought, ah, oh, I remember when I was in the um, in the Vampire, he showed me a rapid aileron roll, and he said, you know, this is the easiest aerobatic manoeuvre you can imagine. What's this? So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll do a rapid aileron roll. Note the word rapid, because idiot that I was, I thought. So I don't get myself in lots of bother. I will do this, but I'll do it slowly. No. <laughs> and so I went like that, and the next thing I knew, I was upside down, hurtling towards the oh ground. Oh, God. Um, going in and out of cloud. And I'm like, whoa, Jesus. Anyway, 
eventually managed to pull myself out of that and decided that, you know, on balance, I didn't want to do any more aerobatics and went home. <laughs> um, but then later on, I had something a bit more dramatic. Um, it was during the formation phase, and I had done mine phase, uh, but they had a Jordanian student, not that he really had anything to do with this issue, but, uh, and they said, do you want to make a third um, with this guy? Uh, because he's just got to finish off. Um, I'm just sitting there, so, so I, off I went. Now, one of the exercises you have to do in um, formation flying is you have to, you're, you're in formation, and then he says, well, you're clear to, uh, clear to move, and you move out, and then the whole idea is that you gently come in, sort yourself out, and come in. Mm. Yeah, that was fine. So I whizzed off, and I was on the other side of the cockpit, because it's a jet provost, to where they were. And I rolled over, gone. No. What? <laughs> so I rolled over some more, gone. And I thought, no, no, hold on. Don't be, don't be thundering down here, not knowing where they are. So I thought, right, break away, and then we'll, we'll sort it out. So I'm breaking away and looking over the cockpit. I was trying to see if I can see them. Next thing is I hear all this rushing sound, and I go into cloud. And I thought, oh, Christ, going to, gone into cloud. By which stage I was hurtling, because I'd gone right over, <laughs> hurtling down. Now, on a previous flight, uh, we'd gone into cloud with an instructor, and he said, you know, what you've got to do, roll the wings level, pull up, full power, re recovery procedure. So I thought, oh, what do I do? What? <laughs> roll the wings level, roll, all oh, right. And of course, I was over controlling like mad. Uh, I had about 40 hours, by the way, and I was 18, just oh, to God. put it all in <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> perspective. So I rolled level, and then I thought, well, now what, now what? Oh, pull, pull, yeah, yeah, I'm right, so I pull. So I pull, I'm pulling, I'm pulling, I'm pulling. Right, what's the next thing, next thing? Speed. So I looked down, zero. Nowhere. It was just sitting there. <laughs> and you know, that was the, you, you think, well, that, that's got to be horrible. But in fact, I thought, oh, thank God for that. I now know where I am in space. I am <laughs> like this. <laughs> but at least I know that. So I then, um, I thought, I don't want to go over backwards. So I then pushed it to try and get it to hammerhead, which it did. But, and thereafter, I then um, got some flying speed and then came back up. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and I have to say that when I eventually managed to call the instructor, my voice was probably a piercing shriek. <laughs> <laughs> and I gave him a completely wrong, um, wrong uh, heading. But what then happened was that um, he said, look, I'll tell you what, I don't know where you are or anything, just make your way, your own way home. And so I did, and I came in, landed, and that was it. And um, I thought, oh God, I'm gonna get in poo for this. <laughs> but they were all thrilled, because I, what I hadn't really hoisted aboard was the weather was crap. And I, I was right on my limits. Really? Getting into land, I didn't think I was gonna get in. Yeah. So once I did get in, they forgot all about that, didn't know about it, and that was that. So. <laughs> That was my second one, and that was in a jet provost. Yeah. That's probably one too many. <laughs> yes. Uh, there are quite a few um, sex, I think, that in my career that have been like that. Anyway. Wow. So then you got posted to the Hunter. What were your first thoughts on the aircraft? Well, of course, we went through the NAT first. Um, and the only reason I say that is, actually, I'm probably very rare in this. I prefer the NAT to the Hunter. Oh, wow. Yes. That's oh, unusual. I've never heard that no, before. No, no, I, I just thought it was a great aeroplane. And the other, I'll just briefly go through that because when I was posted onto the NAT, um, I was still trying to get onto the Lightning. That's what, that was what I really wanted to do, but we'll come onto that a bit later. And um, so I thought, you know, I didn't really do as well as I hoped. I, I, I had no idea how I did, frankly, but um, I, I thought no. And my instructor, wonderful guy, Canadian Air Force guy, he said, look, mate, um, in flying, get all those things out of the way that you know about in advance, and okay. therefore you can deal with all the things that happen to you on flight. And I thought I hadn't really done that on the Jet Provost. So when, I, when we went to Valley, and you could do that in those days, I, I was in the simulator every night. Doing every night? My, every night, going wow. through my checks, you know, get, trying to get a feel for it and all this business. And it worked because on my very first flight, all the checks were like that. I had a wonderful flight, felt good. The morale went up. Hey, what's, <laughs> what's not to like? And I, I do remember when I took off on that, of course, it's back 
back to front. So it's sort of like a fighter. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, the instrumentation was much better than the uh, Jet Provost. So, um, and I just remember putting that power on, this thing thundering down the runway and then lifting up. Ah, wonderful. I, anyway, I preferred the Nat to the Hunter. So, it, great airplane. The thing about the Hunter was it, it was at Chivener and Chivener hallow ground, you know. Um, and it was, you know, where all fighter pilots went and all this, there was a big mystique about it. And when I got there, um, one, one of the dynamics that was different, everyone else I'd been, was um, just students, all like me. Uh, it wasn't there. Because you had a lot of people coming through, a lot of people, right. senior people, uh, very confident when I wasn't <laughs> and it was the whole dynamic wasn't quite right and I did not apply what I'd learnt at Valley which was get those things out of the way prepare right. yourself properly and I didn't enjoy the course particularly um, I would put some of that at their door because it was a pretty harsh environment some of it at my callow youth door um, being an idiot, uh, <laughs> not preparing myself properly, yeah. and so on. But I mean, there's a little story just to show you what it was like there. Um, I went off on a formation flight, first formation flight, and actually, uh, I'll just say this: there's not many things I think I'm good at, but I'm actually, I, I don't mind formation. I quite like oh, it. Okay. So, we signed the 700s, get out to the aeroplane. And um, when we got there, I'm, I'm going around like this, and you know, I was climbing the ladder. And as I climbed the ladder, I saw this hunter go by, and I thought, that's the bloody instructor. So I let it, just threw everything else out the window, <laughs> jumped in the seat, started, didn't strap in, um, didn't do any of that, started thing, chased after him. And he was about 200 yards or more, 500 yards ahead of me then. And I'm trying to strap in on the way out. And I didn't get it all strapped in, and he just took off. And I thought, so we took off, and then I came for the debrief. And the debrief was nothing about the formation at all. It was, look at you effing, mate, sharpen up, you know, get a, this is fighter pilot school, and get on with it, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, what are you doing messing about? Now, not very nice, frankly, <laughs> no. and especially out of the blue, but tell you what I was never late again <laughs> I can imagine <laughs> no. so it was a bit like that Chivna there they, they were there were people there that uh, were not very good instructors there were some that were very good um, but it did have this sort of harsh uh, to, to me attitude and I did actually it's the only time in my overall career I had a sharpen up or else interview um, really yeah um, so, which I deserved, I think, frankly. Mm -hmm. You know, I was being an idiot. Um, it wasn't so much that. My low-level flying wasn't particularly good, and I, I didn't pay enough attention to it. It was all like that. And so I left there um, feeling quite down, really. Um, I got through the course. And in fact, the funny thing about Chivener is they don't fail many people, despite all this okay. pretty harsh environment. Right. Um, and uh, anyway, off I went to 8 Squadron. And the funny thing about that was my mother had to sign to say that I could have a passport <laughs> to go to a war zone. <laughs> That's mad. <laughs> well, I was 19 or something. <laughs> and I think you had to be 21. I can't remember now. Yeah. Me? So, yeah, what was the Hunter like to fly? Well, it, it is what everybody says about the Hunter. It's, a, it's a pretty old fashioned inside, really, even then. Um, black instruments. I, I think if you'd flown a Spitfire, it didn't look much different, frankly, you know, mm. inside. Uh, but an absolutely wonderful aeroplane. Pretty quick, um, handled really nicely. Uh, Combat-wise, you know, it was a biggish wing and it was, it was a great aeroplane. Um, yeah, I had nothing, nothing against it. Really nice aeroplane. Um, it needed a replacement by that time. Right, which yeah. we got. Yeah. Because it, we got the Harrier in the end. Um, and the Phantom ground attack. So, um, yeah, it was a great airplane. But um, as everybody has said, it's rather like Spitfire. Everybody says it's a great airplane to fly. You know, Absolutely, you know. yeah. So, uh, and that's true. Um, and it, it was a good platform too. You know, when I got onto the squadron and we did weapons work and the like. Mm -hmm. um, and at Chivano, we did a lot of weapons work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which actually, I, I was okay. You know, I, I felt about that big most of the time, <laughs> frankly. Um, but um, my, 
my, um, my morale was pretty low, but um, yeah, I, I sort of sailed through yeah. eventually. <laughs> so how many hours did you get on the Hunter? Do you know, I, I, I wondered if you'd ask me that, because I did a tour after that in Aden, and that was two years worth. Um, I'm guessing six, seven hundred. Wow, that's <laughs> yeah. impressive. Yeah, <laughs> that's I, I'm, I'm just guessing from yeah. A tour. And also, when I eventually went, I was posted to one squadron because uh, there was eight squadron in in the Middle East, and I, got, I was posted to one squadron. And and for the first six months, we actually continued to fly the Hunter mm. um, before going onto the Harrier. So let's move on to your Harrier time. How did this transition come about? Was it inevitable or did you choose to go on to the Harrier? No, I, no, it, I just got posted. And when it, in the tours in the Middle East were two years. And so when it started coming up and I was concerned that I would go either to CFS, kiss of death, or, or to, back to Chivana, which I didn't particularly want to do that either. <laughs> and so when they said, no, you're going to one squadron and I knew they were getting the Harrier. And that was it. Absolutely wonderful. I didn't ask for it. Would never have asked for it. I would never imagine that um, I was there. I'll just just go back a little bit because we've suddenly moved away from what I wanted was the lightning, and I'll tell you how that came about. At Valley, the lightning guy, who was a real lightning guy, you know, steely-eyed fighter <laughs> pilot, all that good stuff, gave a presentation about the lightning, and extolled all its virtues. And right at the end, he said, however. He said, if I had my time again, I'd go on the Hunter. He said, because the Lightning is unbelievably wonderful and quick and all that good stuff that we all know about, but it's boring. It's just blasting up to 40,000 feet, chasing a bear delta and coming home short of fuel. How can that be boring? <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> well, if you do it day in, day out. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, that's possible. Uh, and the other thing is some quite frightening sometimes because a friend of mine was on Lightnings and, you know, they do low level intercepts with no rad out. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's you know, a bit, mm. bit scary. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, oh, really? And I thought, yeah, OK, I'll take note of that. And the other thing happened at, just at the end of the course. I was having breakfast with one of the instructors. And he said, oh, what, what, what's, your, what's your choices then? And I said, I thought, I'd better not say hunters. You know, he'll laugh if I had a court here. Uh, I said, Canberra? And he said, no, what do you want, really want to go on? And I said, hunters. He said, say hunters then, for God's sake. You don't know how you've done on the course. So get on with it. <laughs> Got hunters. So let's talk about your training uh, coming from the hunter to the harrier. Was it a big leap forward? Obviously, you got the hover there. Uh, how did you find that? OK, the thing about the harrier was it was a, um, a huge transition from the hunter. So just forget the hovering and everything for a minute. Um, modern instrumentation, moving map displays, head-up display, um, and the cockpit. Now, I, I hear people say now in some of your videos that, oh, it was a mishmash and it was this and that. But compared to the Hunter, it wasn't. And we all thought it was very nicely laid out and ergonomically laid out in a very small cockpit. Now, remembering this is a GR1, so, yeah. um, so to us, unbelievable aeroplane we just couldn't get over it and it just looked fantastic to us it did yeah. i think it's the best looking out of all the models personally yeah uh, it looked good it, the whole principle we were on the the only aeroplane in the world that did v stock and it did it very well and it did it simply very easily you know the, the way it flew and the design of how it flew and the transition from wingborne flight to hovering flight just a piece of ease, apart from one thing. But apart from that, you know, it just did it seamlessly. It was great with a massive engine in the back. That was great. So that was that was one aspect. Um, and to, just to show you the power, when we did the fir very first flight, it was a conventional flight. And so you lined up on the runway. Your instructor, um, a guy who I see quite often, Richie Prophet, gets airborne in the Hunter. And uh, and. He then calls go, and you take off at 80%, because otherwise he can't keep with you. Really? Yeah. Wow. And it, it only started to m sort of make a difference, because he's a turbojet engine, yours a big fan engine, at height, and then you start putting a bit more power on. Probably get worth going back to, um, no simulator, no two-seater. We were just given ground school uh, by some people who only had 30 hours on type 
anyway. Wow. <laughs> which they had done on the, uh, at the manufacturers at Dunsfold. So there were four of them. They did all the grand school. Now, of course, we knew all this. So <laughs> you pay attention. <laughs> you pay attention <laughs> very, very carefully. And the other thing is, rather like the simulator in the valley, they, every evening they used to put power on the aeroplane and you could go and play with it and mm. this and that and the other and at least get used to the checks, used to get all the bits and pieces. Nobody there to check you so you don't get that right or you don't get... I mean the thing I concentrated on was what to do if you had a fire or something really dramatic and I wanted to just make sure I've got that absolutely nailed away. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so we, uh, we could do that every night. Now, the first thing they did I think it's worth saying, very interestingly, um, the instructors said to us, this will be a different course for the ME1, particularly Chivana, that you've been on, because this is a very expensive aeroplane, very complicated, uh, not difficult to fly, but could easily bite you, and, and it bit many. Um, so it's all going to be taken gently. And don't rush. To, we'll take it all gently. We, we don't want crashes at this point, uh, for, for obvious reasons. So the first, the first flight was a taxi around the airfield. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it was brilliant. I absolutely, oh, when I got out of the cockpit, just starting the engine, hearing it and all that, fantastic. And then the next flight, they, they did what they call STO hops. And so you would go down the runway, pull the nozzle lever down, sort of get airborne and then straight away, Put it back down again wow. and you do two or three of these just to sort of get the feel of how it all sort of went um, and then you did a conventional flight now again you know you've never flown this airplane <laughs> and climbed to forty-five thousand feet for a starter right right so up to 45 grand okay roll over put, you know pull the wing that, nothing happens this thing just goes like that yeah you know, it's got at that height it's got no power or hardly anything else uh down to 40 did the same do some turns, pull hard, see what you think. Much there, until you got down to about 30 grand, and then it was beginning to bite a little bit. <laughs> and then, outward turn for combat, go. <laughs> Round we went, and so all, all pulling away. And of course, the Harrier just out climbs the Hunter. That Hunter out turns really? the Harrier. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, it's okay. huge amount of power. Right. Depends how high you are. Yeah. Because with a turbojet engine, but once you're down. The power was immense at low level. Um, even in those aeroplanes, the, I, I forgot now, the, the um, airframe weighed 12,500 pounds and the engine was 20,000. <laughs> and later it went to 20 and a bit or something. But I know that certainly when I went on my second tour, where in Germany you could get these crisp days with really cold and really high pressure. You could almost get a two to one power weight ratio. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. It, it was quick. Yeah. Very quick. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then down we came, uh, came into the circuit, to, did an ILS, did a few circuits, and then a conventional landing, which is the most frightening thing you can ever do in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. Well, you've just got those two little wheels there with yeah, a little yeah. outriggers bouncing around. If you don't get it quite right, you can get yourself into all sorts of wow, trouble. Wow, really? Yeah, yeah. So can you share a few stories from your time on the Harrier? Well, one, of the, one thing I was going to say, um, I don't know what happened to it, but they used to film every single takeoff and landing. Yeah. Right. Trying to get as much training as they possibly could out of it. It was, it was black and white, I think, or maybe the reverse black and white. Whatever. Um, they, did, they, they did this. And, uh, and then they spliced together all the horrible ones, and they called it the horror film. <laughs> And uh, that was well worth watching <laughs> because all sorts of things happened with that. Um, so the Harrier, um, I took to it. I, you know, I'd, I'd got a, away. My first tour I didn't really enjoy. There were some pretty nasty people there, a lot of good people. Um, but to my astonishment, to my utter astonishment, when I had my uh, going away thing from uh, 8 Squadron, well done, good tour, mate. No? Well, he was talking about the right bloke. <laughs> so, okay. So I, I did go to the Harrier, and I, I just felt a new beginning. Was, and I, I took to it. I, it. I didn't find anything that difficult. We had one poor guy in the course, and he, in the very early days, he, he, I don't know quite what happened, 
but he crashed into a field and he said, you know, I can't settle to it, this being slow in the air and all this. And eventually he left and that was a wise decision. Wow, yeah. Um, so, so um, coming straight back after the conventional flight, the one, the hovering flight, the very first hovering flight, and we went to West Raynham, um, only because they had a huge area of concrete with this stuff here. Yeah. They would just blow it apart. So, and they, it was three hovers, stop. And then I think we may have come back for another three or something, but that, it was very relaxed and take your time go through everything in slow motion and it did we went up into the hover it was easy to fly it was straightforward uh, came back down again it was great um, so that's and then you then got into the training proper now remember that was all the training but we were actually on a, a squadron at that time so that was number one squadron and uh, and I, I was on a flight or something which is why I, I got actually on the very first course so you know, everybody's learning a lot yeah. <laughs> and everybody's watching. <laughs> um, and then we went to the squadron. And the thing about being in the squadron, our job, our NATO job, was to uh, defend the flanks of um, NATO. So Norway, basically. Mm -hmm. So we used to, uh, eventually we used to go to Norway quite a lot, Bardafoss and places and stuff like that. And then, uh, but our secondary role was to do trials and also to come up with um, come up with procedures, uh, safe procedures. Um, perhaps the most obvious one that was binned fairly early on was we. Um, what, one of the things we did, we used to go all over the place because people wanted to see the aeroplanes. So we used to go to training units and hover for a while and all this sort of thing. But one of the things we did was the Paris Air Show, and. Um, so we did the Paris Air Show, and, uh, but what happened was, nobody would believe this now, all those Harrier pilots who are watching <laughs> this, they say, you are off your head. Yeah. We used to do formation hovering, and we'd, we'd come into the hover in formation, like this, and, and the formation hover, and, and there were five. We were in a, five airplanes in a, in a, in a big, and um, so we did that. Unfortunately, it stopped there because the flight commander what happened to him was he just suddenly just fell on the floor. And although we were at 100 feet or more, 150 feet, I think, we did these hoverings, because we knew about ingestion, it actually got up there and, it, mm. and that was that. So they went, That's probably enough. wise. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so if anybody ever went to the 1970 Paris Air Show and they got some pictures, it, I, that, it won't prove me a liar, let's put it that way. Yeah, I think you sent one, one over there now. I was like, that can't be them hovering. I, I didn't I even know you did that formation hovering. Uh, oh, oh, <laughs> oh, no, the, the picture I sent you. Now, ah, now this, this is interesting because we practiced, obviously, a fair bit. And on this particular day, there were no airplanes or hardly any. We had two airplanes uh, and, and the boss said, look, I'll tell you what, I'll get one from the OCU. The deputy guy who's going to do this, let him lead it so he can try the leading bit. You've done a lot of them, just sit there, and that was number two, and try and be as steady as you can. Mm. And we'll put the American exchange officer on the outside, because he, he was the spare. Um, so, fine. So we'll all get out onto the runway. Uh, oh, no, onto the grass, by the way. Yeah, this is yeah. all done all <laughs> on the grass. Um, so we get out onto the grass, and it's, it's the same old business, you know, you nod for the power. But in the Harrier, you also nod for the the uh, the nozzle down. Mm. So, and that is about two milliseconds apart, because in the Harrier, and I'm sure it's the same now. You always slammed the engine. You never went gently up. You always slammed it, oh. and it went from 20, 55 percent to 100 percent in two seconds. Wow! It was really quick, um, and uh, and the reason for that was you. It was mostly to get into this habit so that if you were going slowly, like a, a rolling vertical takeoff or something, and you didn't slam it, you could easily get ingestion in the engine. Right. And, and then the engine would bang and then you're in trouble. Uh, so it was always slammed. So I'm sitting there, good old Louis out here. That's it. Right, one, two, three, go. <sighs> bang, Choo! pull the nozzle back, ah, oh, took off. Oh, look at that, hey. Eh? And the next thing that happened, my, I'm, I'm looking over here, and my aircraft just goes. Oh. Ah. 
Oh right. shit! I don't know what happened, I had no idea, and I went to eject, um, probably. And there was Louis' aeroplane, just there. <laughs> I thought, oh God, <laughs> no! Um, and then it, it, it went right over and then hit the ground, the outrigger hit the ground with a hell of a bang. And the aircraft sort of, it sort of, I think the outrigger must have done that and then flicked the aircraft up. Yeah. And so I went and I thought, that was the one moment in my life where actually I knew I was dead. I really? knew it. I just thought, well, you've had it, mate. And uh, I was just waiting for the instrument panel to go, come. And the aircraft did go over, but it then went on to the other outrigger and then stabilised itself. So I'm now about 40 degrees off the original heading. And I think, oh, I might make it. So I slam the bloody power off, um, pu push the nozzles forward, and um, I just held it on the ground for as best I could and to get some speed or something and then yank the thing into the air. And in the OCU there was at uh, Wittering and it was in a dip like this, which was just as well, because if it had been up, I'd have hit it. Wow. Uh, but as it was, um, I went over the, um, the taxiway with another bloody great bang and, uh, and I got airborne and I just remember seeing all these startled faces just down here as I went across this rescue building. Anyway, uh, so I called up uh, the deputy leader, good old Porky, and I said, uh, and he didn't know. <laughs> he said, what? what? I said, look, I've had a problem on takeoff and I think I've written my undercarriage off. Do, do you mind coming and telling me what's, what's left? Um, he said, hmm, looks good to me. He said, your right outrigger, I think it was, the tyres burst, but apart from that, it seems fine. Really? <laughs> yeah. So, um, anyway, I got rid of all the fuel and came back, vertical landing, no sweat. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. But uh, overall, did you enjoy your time on the Harrier? Oh, well, I, I did. If we just sort of slightly move on, I'm just trying to think anything on one squad. We did a lot of better refueling and stuff like this, so it was all pretty exciting stuff. And also, um, doing these trials and things because you, they, they weren't so there were things that you did and then you learnt your lesson and you then said is that wise mm. you know and and then we were passing it on to the to the other squadrons there was um there was a case in, in point where one morning there was a place out at Wittering called Wakeley Oaks and it was just a little copse of woods and there were the um the runway as it were this the field was 1200 feet from hedge to hedge and that's what the manufacturer said it, you could operate out of. So we thought, well, good, good trial there. Um, lovely day, like today, um, summer's day. Um, and so I come in and it, you have to put it right on the nail. Um, you, you know, you're moving everything to make sure you hit that point, mm -hmm. which I did, great. And went hurtling down the runway, put the brakes on, nothing. What? And I could hear the Maxorette units. <laughs> no brakes oh god so I thought oh I don't want to go over this because up beyond that there was a hedge and then beyond it it was quite a steep down slope um, so I thought I know what I'll do I'll, I'll just turn it slightly and try and use the big bit of the field to make a wide arc and come back up again <laughs> it just went like that oh, oh god and um, so I thought I know what I'll do I'll, I'll allow it to go backwards and then I'll whack on a whole load of power and get out of it, which I did. And although you may think, well, you know, yeah, that was pretty exciting. The next guy did the same. Really? Yeah, yeah, right. and he, he, he did actually go into the hedge, but only just, he went in backwards. He didn't quite get the power in in time, but yeah, so yeah, it was exciting stuff here and there. So it sounds <laughs> like you had a great time on that. Yeah, it was great. When I got to three squadron, um, it was nice for me, really, uh, because I had quite a lot of hours on type and nobody else on the squadron did. Um, so that put me in a sort of quite a good position. And also the boss m moved heaven and earth to get me to the squadron. That just made me feel good for once yeah. in my bloody life. Somebody wanted me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we went, we went there. The thing about the, the Germany bit was operating out of fields. and. Uh, that was, you know, it's a, a bit tedious in a way, but it was really exciting stuff. Um, and it was sort of like being on a carrier because you'd have a little tiny field and this airplane would come in and hover and, and we'd take off, off planks. So you, you because it was, you couldn't really take off with a lot of weight straight. Yeah. 
So, you, but just 50 knots was enough to really was double. It? Yeah, yeah, n next to nothing, and you, and you could lift an awful lot. And so we used to operate in in these in these fields. Um, that, that was exciting stuff. It's very exciting. One of my many things that happened to me. <laughs> uh, the boss came up and said, "Hey, look, mate." Um, old so-and-so, no names, no pack drill, um, said that the engine didn't wind up properly when he flew it. And he said, I've just brought it back from the airfield. Uh, seems all right, yeah. Just have a look at it. It'll be all right. Uh, so I thought, right, OK. And I was on a, on a small plank. Uh, yeah, a Mexi, what do they call them? Mexi something or other. Anyway, uh, metal runway bit. But uh, not long. But, you know, I don't know. From here, just 100 yards less. Mm -hmm. Uh, 50 yards, I guess, um, and that's you took off off that. And um, the one thing about the Harry I told you was the engine acceleration was fierce, and and you moved quickly, very quickly. So I went whack with the power, thundered, and the engine went and stopped at about 80 percent, and just started creeping up. I'm too late. The brakes are not going to... I'm already doing 50, 60 knots yeah. or something, or maybe more. The brakes aren't going to do it. I knew at the end of this strip there was a, like a little path, because it was out in the woods, and beyond that there was a ditch. So, big problem. Yeah. So, um, I just hung in there, just waited for the power. It, it got to about 90%, 92% by the time. I thought, Christ, I hope that's enough. <laughs> and um, just yanked it to maximum alpha and hope. Then it climbed away, which it did. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and that was towards the end of my tour, so that was the second tour in Harry's. So I thought, well, do you know, I think I'll opt for something else <laughs> next time. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. <laughs>